Welcome to the uh, extra class license manual and uh, the, the class that we run. We're on chapter 8, part 1. We'll be doing chapter 8 over two weeks, so this, this weekend and next. The pool questions are about evenly split between the two. And uh, especially I'd like to welcome our online viewers, especially anybody that's new. Um, if you're going through this with us in real time, please let us know so we can add you to the mailing list. The mailing list is only active while we're running the class, but it's helpful to get all of the announcements and reminders and so forth. And uh, we always like to start off by asking for any questions from the group here on Zoom, um, anything from last week or anything prior. And if not, we'll go ahead and jump right into the presentation. So this week, it's uh, Chapter 8, Modulation Protocols and Modes. We'll be just going through uh, section 8.1, all of it, and most of section 8.2. We'll finish 8.2 next week and do 8.3. The final section next week is mostly on amateur television, which is a very interesting topic. So we'll get to that next week. And let me get my HDMI active here and get my laser going. There we go, cool. All right, and um, I don't know if I've done this before, but I just wanted to give credit where credit's due here. A lot of our, a uh, lot of input for our class comes from AWRL materials, and Dave Kastler, of course, we've mentioned a number of times, and he's uh, kindly granted us uh, permission to use uh, graphics where they're helpful to us, which we have. And we've had a lot of uh, input from past students, some of the uh, tips and techniques and memory aids have been a, a result of people sharing what they've done 
to help master this material. So feel free to pass those along if, if you have any creative ways to remember some of the answers. So this is for tonight. So the book starts out with FCC emission designators and in Kastler's uh, presentation, uh, he went through some of these. Uh, the FCC has specific uh, emission designators. For example, A1A is CW. Uh, all of us will just refer to the, the modes as the, uh, what we know them by um, normally. <laughs> so, we just say CW or sideband or AM or uh, AFSK ready and so forth. We don't bother with all of these uh, F FCC designators, but they are all in the rules and they all have definitions if anybody's curious. And it used to be when we filled yeah, out... Yeah, it used to be when you had to fill out the log. Yep. I remember as a novice. Me too. CW, yep. A1A. You had to write it down, but that's all history now. Um, just a few notes about what all of this is. Modulation systems. Now, the whole concept of modulation systems is that, well, we, we want to send by radio some, some kind of RF energy, and we have to impress upon that RF signal some kind of intelligence, uh, either speech or data or, or video, something like that. So the whole idea of a modulation system is to get that information onto the radio carrier so we can send it across the country. So we're all familiar with amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, phase modulation, just some typical things that we use all the time. And this last bullet here, I wanted to include because there's one pool question that references angle modulation. And all we need to know about that is that frequency and phase modulation are both forms of angle modulation. In fact, on the received end of um, FM or, or PM, uh, it sounds exactly the same. We've touched on this a little bit before, but I wanted you to pick up on the word angle modulation so that the pool question wouldn't throw you. And then here's an animation, which we may have seen before, that this is a signal, like an audio signal. And with AM, we see the amplitude of the carrier being varied in accordance with the input signal. And with FM, we see that the frequency is actually shifting a little bit, corresponding with the input signal. So where these, um, where these waves are compressed, the frequency is higher than the carrier. Where they're spread out, it's lower than the carrier. And that frequency shift is happening at the signal rate, at, at the audio rate. So in this case, it would probably be a, a tone, maybe a thousand cycle tone, because they're all even. With voice, it would be a lot a lot sloppier. So a little bit more on frequency and phase modulation. As I said, the RF frequencies varies at the rate of the modulating signal frequency. And I'll kind of use 29 megahertz as, as a reference as I'm talking through all of this. Something kind of uh, interesting happens at 29 megahertz in the FCC rules. More on that to come. So the amount of frequency change is proportional to the modulation signal amplitude or loudness. So the distance uh, that we shift from the carrier frequency is determined by how loud we are. So let, let's say that I'm just talking in a normal voice here and let's say I'm maybe deviating at plus or minus 2.5 kilohertz. And then if I talk really, really loud, <clears throat> which my voice won't let me do, <laughs> then it, perhaps I'm uh, modulating a, a, or deviating by plus or minus five kilohertz. The pollen here in South Carolina the, is... Yeah, ugh. pollen is nasty here. Yep. And somebody might have the thought go through their head, well, if, if you talk really loud, then what prevents you from splattering onto adjacent uh, frequencies? On um, two meter FM, for example, uh, most systems are plus or minus five kilohertz. Uh, but if you talk really loud, you'd go outside that. Well, there's limiters built into the equipment to keep you within that uh, five, plus or minus five kilohertz range. Now, there's two things we'll be talking about, a deviation ratio and modulation index. And if you read the book, 
the license manual or listen to Kessler, uh, I'd be willing to bet that you came away really, really confused. <laughs> the, these uh, concepts overlap one another, and, it, and it's kind of hard to tell them apart. Um, I'll be simplifying that fairly radically for you tonight, so um, we'll, we'll be able to get through that. So we already talked about the amount of deviation from the carrier is um, determined by the loudness of the signal. The deviation ratio, and I've italicized a couple of words, is the ratio of the maximum deviation. For example, let's say that the maximum would be plus or minus five kilohertz to the highest modulating frequency. So it's a ratio of, of two frequencies. So if the maximum deviation were plus or minus five kilohertz, and for voice, typically um, amateur voice, is always uh, three kilohertz or less. So those would be the two numbers that we could work with in figuring out deviation ratio. Now, because we're talking about deviation and audio frequencies, neither of those have anything to do with the RF carrier frequency. And there is a pool question, it's a tricky one, um, that, that asks what changes with the RF frequency, and it, it doesn't. Probably touch on that again. So the deviation ratio, once it's calculated, will be constant for a given transmitter and modulator, and same for all frequencies and bands. That'll come up again. And here's a diagram, uh, originally from Kessler. A couple of things to note here. To start off with, we are going to be applying a modulating waveform, in this case, of one volt. So that, that's the, um, that this is a tone again. It's a, a nice even sine wave a tone of, um, in this case, one volt. And that's going to result in an FM carrier frequency deviation of plus or minus 1.5 kilohertz. So if this is the carrier frequency, we're going to be deviating above and below that by 1.5 kilohertz. Now if we double the loudness, we go from one volt a one volt tone to two volts applied, the deviation is going to double to plus or minus three kC kilohertz. I keep saying kC, but that's really old terminology. It's kilohertz these days. So, so that's just showing how the input volume is going to change the output deviation of the carrier. So here come well, the... Gary, I have a question. Okay. Gary's my brother. Um, <laughs> I'm Dave. I'm sorry. Um, going back to the uh, deviation part, if you look at both the both parts, it, on the uh, deviation, it says the ratio of the maximum frequency deviation. And on the... Um, on the uh, modulation index, it has the ratio of the maximum signal frequency deviation. Right. What's the difference between the frequency and the signal um, signal frequency um, deviation? Okay, I'll cover that in, in the next slide here. So hang hang on for a minute. I, I'm about to oh, really? about to explain that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yep. But uh, kudos to you for ha having read through that and been confused by it because that is very confusing. So uh, we're going to talk about deviation ratio first and then modulation index next. And I think that'll answer your question. So here's uh, some blue text for us. So deviation ratio is the ratio of the maximum carrier frequency deviation to the highest audio modulating frequency. So um, for any particular radio, um, let's say that the maximum carrier frequency deviation is uh, plus or minus five kilohertz. That's normally set by the radio manufacturer. Sometimes there's a menu option to switch it from five kilohertz to, to 2.5 kilohertz, because in a lot of places, uh, the channels are narrower on repeaters. So you can control that. So that would be the maximum carrier frequency deviation, which I'm gonna assume is five kilohertz for right now. 
Now this word here, highest audio modulating frequency, and that will normally be 3,000 cycles, 3 kilohertz for, for speech. So that, that, that's a, a constant ratio. Uh, 5 divided by 3 is about 1.67. And here, here's another example here that's uh, from a pool question. Calculate the deviation ratio of an FM phone signal having a maximum frequency swing of plus or minus 7.5 kilohertz when the maximum modulation frequency is 3.5 kilohertz. Now this isn't a very realistic example because pretty much any radio that we use is going to have a, a uh, maximum frequency swing of plus or minus 5 and a maximum voice frequency of 3, but just for the sake of, of working the problem, the ratio is simply 7.5 divided by 3.5. They're both kilohertz, so you can ignore that part. So the, there is a, a, a bit of a trick coming up that I'm going to show you. For the exam, for both, both deviation ratio and modulation index, we haven't talked about modulation index yet, divide the bigger number by the smaller, and in all cases, no unit conversions are needed. You might remember back to when we were talking about op amps. Remember we had the trick there, the bigger divided by the smaller. Well, the same principle will apply here. So that's deviation ratio. And that's a constant it's, um, built into the radio basically by the manufacturer and it won't change for any band that you go to. It's not sensitive to RF frequency. Now modulation. Okay. This is just the modulating portion, right? Nothing to do with the RF on the previous one. Nothing to do with the RF carrier frequency okay. whatsoever. Thank you. Yep. And it's good to remember that because there will be a pull question that asks that very thing. So let's move now from deviation ratio to modulation index. They sound very similar. And I think we'll clear up the confusion here. Modulation index is the ratio of frequency deviation to the modulating signal frequency. There's one word that's missing there from the previous definition for modulation, uh, the, the, the previous one that we were looking at, deviation ratio. Um, it was maximum signal frequency. What's happening with modulation index now is that it's still the, modul the ratio of frequency deviation to the modulating signal frequency, whatever that happens to be at the time. So during speech, that would be all over the place. So the only way to really measure modulation index meaningful is to use a, a continuous tone to do so. Another way of saying that is it's the ratio of maximum RF frequency deviation, plus or minus 5 kilohertz, for example, to the instantaneous modulating frequency, which varies continuously with speech. Let's see what the, what the ramifications of that are. They're just two, def, two definitions. And here's something significant. 1.0 is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for angle modulation, which means AM, uh, or not AM, uh, frequency modulation or phase modulation below 29 megahertz. So there's a, a magic number below which you can't operate a ratio that's, that's any higher than this. Dave, yeah. are, you, are you basically over-modulating if you go above that index and it takes you out of the frequency or something? Is that, is that the point of this? Or? Well, you'd be um, exceeding an FCC limit if, if you were uh, greater, greater than that. So th for, for that reason, the only place that you'll find FM on, on the HF frequencies is in the 10 meter band above 29 megahertz. That's about the only place you'll ever find it. And again, modulation index is not dependent on the RF carrier frequency. There's a pull question that tries to throw you off a little bit on that. So the, the difference between um, what we saw first, which was deviation ratio, that, that's a constant because we're talking about the highest possible audio modulating frequency for modulation index, um, it's whatever input frequency to the modulator is being applied at the time. So they're very closely related concepts. One is a constant, this, this one is constantly changing, and we need to be aware of this FCC 
item. And again, modulation index is not dependent on the RF carrier frequency. So here's a calculation example. Maximum frequency deviation of 3000 hertz, either side of the carrier frequency, when the modulation frequency is 1000 hertz. The calculation is, is exactly the same. It's the, the, the bigger divided by the smaller, which is three. A little bit more on this. So we saw that the FCC limits modulation index to a maximum of 1.0 under 29 megahertz. And here I'm, I'm showing the frequency chart for the 10 meter band. And then um, this is from a document that I think we've shared before. Here's, here's the PDF if you want to see the whole thing. But you'll notice that uh, for FM, frequency modulation, you'll only see that above um, 29 megahertz. So here's the repeater inputs. FM simplex, repeater outputs, all above 29 megahertz. Now, I'm not aware of any FM repeaters on 10 meters in our area. I don't know if there's, uh, they exist too much anyplace else in the country, but uh, according to FCC rules, they, they are allowed there. There are some on the East Coast. I remember New York City um, uh, had some. Uh, we've got some six meter repeaters locally, but that's uh, uh, that's as close, uh, and it's been a long time since I worked in a, in a 10 meter repeater. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that, the, the, this is the practical ramification of, uh, of, of this FCC item. Now here's something else that may ring a bell because we've talked about it before. Deviation as a function of modulating frequency. Remember with, uh, with FM, also we call the direct FM, the deviation depends only on the modulation, modulating signal amplitude. With phase modulation, we get a, a feature for free. It has to do with the physics of, of a phase modulator. So in a phase modulator, uh, deviation depends on both the modulating signal amplitude, like it does here, but also the, uh, the, the frequency. So as you go from, let's say, 500 hertz uh, being applied to the modulator to 1,000 hertz, that's double, and that, that's, that will deviate more um, as, uh, on, on the output of the radio. So because of this, remember we talked about pre-emphasis and de-emphasis in an earlier uh, lesson? This, this just happens automatically. It, it plays into the picture here because modulation index and deviation ratio um, have, have to take that into account. Now, you, you're probably wondering, well, th am I ever going to use this for anything? Um, the only thing I can think of is passing your extra exam. <laughs> because in calculating these engineering uh, aspects, uh, the, the radio manufacturers have, have done that for us. We don't have to worry about any of that. If you were to build your own equipment, then, of course, it would, would be different. But not, not too many people are doing that from scratch. So there, there is a difference between phase modulation and direct FM. So what we actually do on the uh, direct FM side, we, we use the concept of pre-emphasis so that it, that, that curve will look like this, and then it's flattened out again in the receiver. And again, we've discussed that in a past, uh, past lesson. Now we're gonna jump into something completely different. I don't have one of Gary's completely different slides, so I'll just have to say it. Now, this concept is multiplexing. And it's combining more than one stream of information into one modulating, one modulated signal. Here I've got a box of transistors, just for uh, illustration. Consider each one of these little bins a separate conversation that's going on. So I'll have to disconnect from my funny little box here. We're going to put those different conversations into a cardboard box. So in this cardboard box, we've got five or six or seven different conversations uh, going on at the same time. We'll close up the box, put it on a FedEx truck, and ship the truck across the country. So there, there's a parallel to, uh, uh, to radio here. It's possible to take multiple simultaneous conversations through the technique of multiplexing combine it into what we call a baseband, 
we're going to modulate the carrier with all of those voice uh, conversations and then ship it out over RF to wherever wherever we're talking. So just, just kind of hold that as a, as a concept for the moment. So there's a couple of ways to do this. There's frequency division multiplex or FDM using multiple subcarriers, which I'll explain and illustrate. And then there's another one called time division multiplex where we're interleaving two or more signals into degree into discrete time slots. So one uses subcarriers, one uses time slots. So here's an example of frequency division multiplex using analog subcarriers. At a high level, we're putting each voice uh, conversation into, uh, we're multiplexing them up to some different frequencies. We're taking all of those, we'll take that output and apply it to what's called a summer, uh, like the sum where you add things up, not summer like uh, green leaves and warm weather. We apply it to the transmitter, the receiver picks it up and then reverses the process. So in terms of a pool question, frequency division multiplex, two or more information streams merged into a baseband, which then modulates the transmitter. And common usage uh, in electronics, amateur multi-carrier digital modes, which we really won't get into, early phone company carrier circuits work this way. Cable TV uses this technique. And FM broadcast subcarriers, the MUSAC that's um, transmitted out to businesses from FM stations uses use a subcarrier. Now I'm going to expand this a little bit um, and kind of show how it works. So. Uh, a, a normal conversation would, is going between point or 100 hertz to 3.5 kilohertz, the way that they're showing it here. We actually just go up to about um, 3 kilohertz in amateur radio. So this, this, this is just raw audio here. And then what, what we're going to do, we're going to have a 4 kilohertz um, subcarrier, and we're going to combine a second audio um, program with that 4 kilohertz, shifting it up to 4.1 to 7.5 kilohertz. So we keep these conversations apart because one has been shifted up in frequency. Notice that those frequencies are above the 4 kilohertz, so this looks like upper sideband they're using. Then there's another one at 8 kilohertz. We've shifted another voice channel. Now we've got three people talking at once, up to 8.1 to 11.5, and so forth uh, on, up, on up the band. So all of this combined then can go into that you sum all of those signals together, apply them to the transmitter, send them out, and then decode them on the other side. So that's an example of frequency division multiplex where we're using subcarriers to shift those individual conversations. Again, just a review of the overall concept. Now let's go to digital time division multiplex. The concept here is time slots. So the first one we were using uh, sub carriers to move different channels and then, then summing them and transmitting them. In this case, we've got, look at these conversations. We've got conversation A, B, C, and notice what we're doing, we're, we're rapidly switching. So I'm gonna be talking to somebody here, and Gary's gonna be talking to somebody else over here, and George is gonna be talking to somebody over here, and we are switching these so quickly that uh, everybody on the, on the DMUC side, that we're multiplexing these that over here, we're demultiplexing them over here, and it's happening so quickly that my conversation and my conversation partner will think that nothing unusual is happening. But what, what's really happening is we're switching quickly between all of these so that we can support, in this case, five conversations over one channel, over one transmitted signal. So digital time division multiplex is two or more signals that are arranged to share discrete time slots of a data transmission. 
So time um, division multiplexing is time slots, time and time. So here's the individual signals, and we're sampling them at, at sequential times. So here's signal one, here's this time slot, signal two on a different time slot, signal three, and this is what exists that we're going to apply to a modulator and then transmit it across the country. So d two different approaches to multiplex. Again, we won't see any of this happening on HF, but we need to know about it. More of a close-up. So each conversation is sampled and inserted into a time slot in a digital data stream. This is also called interleaving. This used to be a popular method for telecom companies to deliver oh, yes. service to businesses. Yep, absolutely. T1 was that way, 24 yep. channels. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it uh, did the round robin in 1.5 megahertz. Yep, yep, very good. Yep, you've got that background. I, I dealt with that in the cellular world as, as well. And uh, the switching speed is fast enough to create the impression of a dedicated circuit for each conversation. So in the telephone company case we were talking about, you could actually get 24 of these going at the same time. So in amateur usage, um, this technology is used with D-Star, which some of you have played with, some digital modes, satellite repeater telemetry, and then commercial usage, uh, digital phone circuits, um, and ISDN service. I didn't know until today, because I was re researching this a little bit, but ISDN basically is no more. The plain old telephone service, um, meaning just wires be between houses, and um, ISDN was actually mandated to cease um, in August. Yeah, it was It was actually the first digital, well, well it was a subset. Two yep. channels of 128. Yep. POTS, POTS service, plain old telephone service, yep. is just pure analog. Yep. But that's... Um, been mandated to go away effective August 2nd of 2022. So by 2025, uh, all that stuff will, should, should be gone from any kind of commercial service. And I just learned that myself. So on to some exam questions. Now I know we covered some of that stuff really quick. Um, I'm hoping that I explained it well enough so that um, it, it, it'll be retained for at least 10 minutes. So we'll see. And if you have spotlight, yeah, we will do that. All right. Oh, and let me do a mute all and then unmute to answer if you want to. What is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for angle modulation, modulation below 29 megahertz? Okay. So somebody's got bravo. their speakers running and it's coming back into their microphone. Bravo. Bravo. Yep. It, it, it was bravo. And Gary said somebody's got their speakers bravo. running. Bravo. It was bravo. And it, it's running back in. The only way I can fix that is to do a mute all. So whoever was unmuted was, was the person that was causing that. Um, so you, you unmute to answer, but then mute yourself right away, and we won't have that echo. All right, so that was correct. The highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulating frequency for angle modulation, FM or PM, below 29 megahertz. That was 1.0. Correct. What is the modulation index of an FM signal? Now, they've been kind to us in terms of, um, of the answers. So we're getting at the uh, deviation ratio versus modulation index. It's going to be the ratio of two frequencies. Alpha. It is, it is alpha. Alpha? It is alpha. It is, it is Correct. alpha. Thank you for muting. Uh, what is the modulation index of an FM signal? It's the ratio of frequency deviation to modulating signal frequency. Um, right, exactly. That's the uh, tricky. Uh, now I've bolded something that won't be bolded on your exam. How does the modulation index of a phase modulated emission vary with RF carrier frequency? Alpha. Well, this, this well, it, it, it's delta, 
And uh, I, I tried to emphasize that the RF carrier frequency does not play into either modulation index or deviation ratio. It doesn't depend on which band you're on. So that this is an easy one to get tripped on. So if it says RF carrier frequency, it does not depend on the RF carrier frequency. What is the modulation index of an FM phone signal having a maximum frequency deviation of 3000 hertz either side of the carrier frequency when the modulating frequency is 1000 hertz? Frequency is 1000 alpha. hertz. Okay, alpha. exactly. It's the bigger one divided by the smaller one. And here's another one. They're asking for modulation index, but the formula works exactly the same way. Oh. Bigger divided. Bravo. Bravo. Bravo, right. Yep. Bravo. Got it. Three of you get an A. Everybody else, well, you, you can stay with us. <laughs> E8BO5, what is the deviation ratio of an FM signal having a maximum frequency swing of plus or minus five kilohertz when the maximum modulation uh, modulation frequency is three kilohertz. Yeah. 1.67. One, one, yep, 1.67. Alpha. Yep, correct. Um, yeah, it's the same pattern for every one of these so that the math is extremely easy. So none of this should trip you, even though the words sound very complicated. Okay, and here's another one, works the, pretty much the same way. It's deviation ratio, but it doesn't matter because the formula works the same. Better because the formula works the oh, same. Alpha. 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 alpha, okay, 7.5 divided by 3.5, or 2.14. Okay, now here they're asking for a definition, definition. Deviation ratio was the first one that we discussed. Remember that it involves the maximum deviation and the highest bravo. audio frequency. And it is bravo, the ratio of the maximum carrier frequency deviation to the highest audio modulating frequency. Correct? What? Okay, now we're going to jump into some multiplexing questions. What is frequency division multiplexing? Now, kind of remember what we talked about a little bit. Frequency division multiplexing has something to do with subcarriers. Two or more Bravo. correct. Two or more information streams are merged into a baseband, which then modulates the transmitter. What is digital time division multiplexing? Time is the key word. Bravo. Bravo. Yep, and I, I bolded time. Bravo. I, I bolded time slots here because time division. Time slots go together. Won't be on the test that way. Won't be on the test that way, no. Nor, nor will the answer be B, in all likelihood, if you get this one. And then we'll move on to digital protocols and modes. So we just covered a lot of uh, pretty complicated stuff, but uh, we, we got through it all. And then review that, and um, I, I think you'll have it. So where can we find digital activity? Well, here's uh, some places on the band, the uh, considerate operator's guide that I commented on earlier, and the, the, the link was on the earlier slide, which will work when you get the attachment. That Gary publishes normally the day, day after our class. Um, we'll, we'll list all of these for you. So here's some flavors of digital across the ham bands. Does anybody know what this radio is? I'm thinking somebody probably has one. 7300 icon. Yep. yep. Yeah, that, that, that's a radio that we highly recommend for, for new hams if, if it's in their price range. They're about a thousand bucks, but there, there are several radios in that price range that are, are pretty excellent. Um, but that, that's what this is. Uh, I like it in particular because it's an SDR. It can actually be controlled from a computer if you want to. It's a closer look. Here's just the chart again. And it, each, um, each mode tends to have its own watering hole. For example, uh, RTTY is at, at certain places of, of the band. 
is indicated here. FT8, which isn't on this chart, um, but that, that's a specified frequencies. That, that's what I mean by watering holes. You can find a digital activity grouped by, by frequency. That's just um, been agreed to by, by hams in general. There's a book here that I highly recommend, Getting on the Air with HF Digital. This is now in its third edition. The, um, I, I bought the first and second edition when they came out. And they were sort of okay, but they were kind of disappointing too. They've really got their act together here um, with the third edition. This has got chapters, uh, and this is specifically for HF Digital. Um, they, they've got chapters on most of the common modes, and I, I found this to be extremely helpful. So if you're interested in getting into HF Digital, um, I've put a link up there. And for anything that you're wanting to get into in a new digital mode, Find somebody that's doing it already, and it'll save you tons and tons of time. Okay, we're going to talk about some interesting things now. Symbol rate, data rate, bandwidth, protocols, and codes. A, a lot of this material changed in the current edition of the license manual. And since we're in the third year now of this license manual, it'll, it'll be changing next year. Um, or actually, it's in July of this year, isn't it, Gary? No, it's the, next year. Oh, it's next year, okay. I would imagine that a, a lot of the information that we're seeing in this section will be updated or, or changed because digital is moving so fast. So first of all, some definitions. <clears throat> And those of you that were with us when we went through the general class will see some things that are uh, reviewed here, uh, which, which will enhance what you learned before. And if this is new to you, um, these are useful concepts. So a bit is the fundamental unit of data. It's either a zero or a one. Now, does anybody know uh, where the term bit came from? Well, it's a contraction of binary digit. A binary digit is a bit. It's either a zero or a one. The bit rate, this sounds obvious, the number of digital bits per second sent from one computing system to the other. Bits per second. Now a symbol is a characteristic of the transmitted signal that represents data. And as we'll see in a minute, you can the, the symbol rate, the signaling events per second, and the bit rate, the bits per second, can be different. And here's a, some pool text. Symbol rate for digital transmissions, the rate at which the waveform changes to convey information. So we're changing something about the RF carrier or what we're modulating onto the carrier at a certain rate, a certain number of changes per second. And you might notice that these two are very similar. Baud or baud's number of symbols sent per second. That's the symbol rate. Which is two different ways of saying the same thing here. And this is how it appears in the pool. Symbol rate and baud are the same. And a, a little quick diversion here, um, data link versus air link. So here's, um, uh, let's see, this should be Brian and this should be Jane, I think. So Brian wants to talk to Jane and they don't care anything about what's going on out here. They, they just want to be able to communicate. Let's see that they're communicating digitally. So what's going to happen here, um, Brian's going to interface with his computer as will Jane. And what's happening behind the scenes is that inf that digital information is going to go to a modulator. It, then it's going to go over the air. It will be received on Jane's side, be demodulated, converted to data, and then come back to some kind of usable information that, that she can understand. And obviously it, it can both go both directions. So that's a concept of a data link and an air link. So the people don't much care what's happening out here. The computers don't care what's going on over here. So there's little conversions that are taking place back and forth 
to complete that path. The error link is the radio signal. The data link is what the computers use to talk to each other. And then here's the complete communications channel. Oh, now it's Bob and Alice. They must have, must have changed. So we, we have a virtual information link as person to person. Because they don't need to care about what's happening over there. But of course, as hams, we do care. And then we have a virtual data link, which is computer to computer. And that exists only because we've transmitted it over the air. We've modulated it and demodulated it and come back here. So those are the three channels that are, are kind of running virtually. Now the baud rate versus bit rate example. Um, again, some of you have, have seen some of this before, if you were with us in the previous, uh, in the general class. But th this, this example really, really was a help to me. Um, we've got somebody raising their hand here. And I'm very thankful that they didn't use any impolite signals in the process here, which could have happened. So let's hold up one hand. We're going to call that one signaling event or symbol. If you did that once per minute, it would be one baud, one symbol, or uh, once per second. Yep. In this example, one signaling, signaling event can represent six states. So we've got five fingers and a closed fist. Um, it, but five, five elements would give us the opportunity. Two to the fifth equals 32. So we could actually re represent 32 bits of information just by combinations of fingers. So if we raise the hand once per second, that's one baud could be as many as 32 bits per second if we had values assigned to each finger. Now, where do we see this in electronics? Well, we, we can, here we're, we're showing different numbers of fingers, but electronically, we can have phase shifts. We can have a carrier and we can shift its phase by 180 degrees or 90 degrees or any number of degrees. Tone frequencies sent for uh, radio teletype, for example, we're alternating between two frequencies in discrete levels. We can combine changes in amplitude, frequencies, and phase shifts to get a very complicated um, modulation system that can transmit a number of different, quite a large number of bits for each signaling event. Now, what the, uh, another way to look at this, um, let's say that you're at a party. It's kind of a loud party. There's a lot of people there, and your friend is across the room. And you might want to say hi to your friend just by waving at him. Or you might want to uh, say, bring me, a, bring me a cheeseburger. So if I hold up one finger, that means bring me a cheeseburger. If I hold up two fingers, I'm saying bring me a cheeseburger and a Coke. So in each case, I just raised my hand once, but I've conveyed different kinds of messages, different information across the room. So that's... Um, how electronics, uh, how it's done electronically too, except we're sending bits, not cheeseburgers and Cokes. So for binary counting, I commented that um, with, with five elements, you could represent up to um, 32 different states. So by assigning a number to each finger, this is the one finger, the two, four, eight, 16, if I, if I raised all 16, all 16 fingers, hmm, that's interesting. If I raised all five fingers, if, if you added all of these up, you'd get 31, plus you've got zero, which would be a closed fist. That would be um, the, the 32 that I was talking about. Now, it would be really, really tough for me to be flashing different finger combinations and for you to be figuring this out on the other side of the room, but computers have no trouble with that whatsoever. So this, this is an example of, of binary counting. And um, let me move on to another concept here. Um, baud and bits per second. We alluded to this earlier. A more efficient digital code can increase the data rate without increasing bandwidth. 
So the, the number of symbols um, in, in, in the path can convey uh, different numbers of, of, of bits. More on that to come. So data rate, bits per second, can be greater than the baud rate when there are more than two states per transition. So you, some of you might remember the very first modems that came out when your computer uh, could hook up to CompuServe and you could send email and it was just the coolest thing in the world. Well, the very early modems were only 300 baud. They only had two states on and off, basically. They, they were sending digital tones or audio tones, actually, uh, and then bits per second, only 300. But then we came to a case where, let, let's say in this case here, we were still uh, changing the signaling rate only at 300 baud, but each one of those states could represent, each one of those changes could represent eight different conditions, eight bits. And we could actually, at uh, 300 baud, we could actually be transferring 1,200 bits per second. Then you were really living. Notice that that's like four times. And at, of course, the prices went up. Every time somebody came out with a new modem, you could pay more to get, get a faster one. And we got all the way up to 50, 56K. And of course, then you were really living. You, you could not normally get 56K because the telephone circuits wouldn't, wouldn't support that speed, but you could approach it. And these devices were pretty smart. They would say, well, if I can't uh, communicate at this higher rate, I'll just keep backing down until I find one that's stable and that, that's where your connection would wind up. So that, that was very, very cool back in the day. So the point of it all is bit per se bits per second can be much higher than the baud, or symbols per second. Oh, let's see if we had some blue text there. Oh yeah, we did. A more efficient digital code can increase the data rate without increasing bandwidth. Because the bandwidth goes up as the symbol rate goes up. A few more terms here. Anybody know what this is, by the way? That is the famous or infamous secret decoder. Decoder ring. Decoder oh, ring. Roger. Exactly, exactly. And here's a different kind of decoder ring. That This is RTTY tape. Um, but anyway, protocol, what, did, what does the word protocol mean? It's rules for encoding, packaging, and exchanging, and decoding digital data. So that's how do you combine um, all, all of the parts and pieces in order to form it into something coherent that, that can be transmitted and then reverse engineered on the other side. So protocol, rules for encoding, then a, a code is a method of conversion to and from digital data. They don't ask us any questions about this, but they're, they're terms that can be useful to know. Now there's uh, something called Vericode, or Vericode. When PSK31 first came out, it was uh, the first really popular amateur mode, and it just took ham radio by storm. Um, there were tons and tons of people using it. And it, it used a, a concept called Vericode where uh, they were sending different numbers of bits for different kinds of letters. And I'll, I'll expand on that in a minute. Variable length coding for bandwidth efficiency. So in the letter E, for example, would be a different number of bits than the letter Q. Another uh, code used was Bado. It's different pronunciations, but I'll, I'll use that one to stay consistent with Kessler and others. Bado is five bits. If there's one thing I want you to remember about Bado and radio teletype is that it's got five bits. It'll help answer a pool question. Now five bits, um, two to the fifth power is only 32. So you can't get all of the uppercase letters, the lowercase numbers, number, um, numbers and, and punctuation in, in just 32 uh, little buckets but there's some tricks there we'll, we'll cover. We're, we're gonna do, use a shift character so that we can move between numbers and letters. We'll show you that coming up. And then there's ASCII. Normally seven bits allow numbers and letters without the shift character. Um, two to the seventh power is 128. So obviously you can get uppercase, lowercase numbers and some other goodies in there. We'll expand on that as well. 
So th these are just different methods of converting to and from digital data with, with some things that we use in ham radio. And here's a little bit big, bigger picture. Uh, now, if, if one of the holes didn't get punched out completely, then you'd have a hanging chad, right? Remember the hanging chads from the, from the Florida election? <laughs> well, we'll have a, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about this too. I'll show you some pictures. Okay, we saw this. Now, there's something called ALE, Automatic Link Establishment. Every time I run into some term that they have in the pool questions, and they don't do a very good job of explaining it, that makes my spider senses tingle and I have to go research it. So I'll spend just a minute telling you what this is all about. Automatic link establishment. We're moving on to a different protocol now. It automatically determines the best band for communication between two stations, and then it will alert the operator on the other end when they have found that path. And hams are beginning to use this. I'll give you a link here in a minute. Actually, it's right here. In computers, I think they use handshaking. Well, they do. That that's another another concept. But right right now, we're just talking about automatic link establishment, and I'll show you how that works. So, two hams using the ALE protocol, one in New York, one in Los Angeles. They'd like to be able to talk to one another. And what ALE does, it will try on 17 meters, and you'll see that we're actually skipping over each other at that point. So we're going to try 17 meters, oh, no, no good. We're going to try it on 40 meters. And here the, the skip is actually coming up short, no go. But on 20 meters, look, look what's happening. We do have a path on 20 through the ionosphere, and as the signals, these different bands come down in different places, uh, we now have a winner on 20 meters. So the ALE will um, alert the other operator that we have a signal path on 20 meters and you can proceed with, with your QSO. So, and there is a pool question related to this. How ALE stations establish contact? They constantly scan a list of frequencies, activating the radio when the designated call sign is received. They have a question. Sure. So do band plans set aside space for this so that these automatic systems don't step on other people? Well, they're transmitting back and forth automatically until they find the link. Yeah, that there are specific frequencies des designated for automatic control. I, I don't know for sure that, that that's how ALE works, but this link right here goes into all of those workings in great, great detail. So I'd, I'd refer you there to, to get more information. I've not used it myself, but because it's a pool question, I wanted to just briefly explain the concept of how it works. So if you find out, let us know. Or if I think of it, I'll, I'll look it up too. Now there's another kind of varied code that um, um, has been around for a very, very long time, like 1844 back to Morse and, and Vail when the Morse, Morse code was invented. So anybody know what this is over here? If you're really... That really, looks like old printer uh, little type print, machine. Well, it, it's called a type case. And for those of yeah. us that are, are uh, more on the ancient, <laughs> ancient side than the younger <laughs> side, I remember when I was in ninth grade, which, which was about 1910, I think, <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, we had four quarters of industrial arts, and, and one of the quarters was printing. And we, we actually used this to do manual printing, because they just kind of wanted us to know the history, I guess. And notice what we have here. The E-bin is the biggest one in the type case. And then some of these other ones, like uh, J and Z, they're, they're little tiny boxes in the type case. So what we would actually do is pull out a letter E, it, it was a chunk, a little uh, cube of, of lead, and you put it in a, uh, a, a metal type carrier, and you had to actually do this backwards because when you printed, it, it would be in reverse. So you'd put these uh, on the printing press ap after assembling the words, and um, that, that's how printing used to work, old-time newspapers.
Well, how does this relate to Morse code and anything that we're doing? Well, back when Morse was in inventing Morse code, they said, well, which letters do we want to make the shortest? In other words, uh, if, if we would make the most often used letters, the ones that um, had the shortest code, we could speed up the, the overall throughput. So that turned out to be E. Now the way this chart works, and I've, I've showed this to people that have been extras for a long time, they'd never seen this, this format before, uh, and, and were just totally amazed by it. Now there, there's a little thing that says start here. So if you want to send the letter E, you start here and find E, and what is it? It's one dot. If you want to send the letter I, we've got dot, dot. So the shorter letters um, have a, a, a different number of code elements in them. And some of the letters that are, are not used as often, like if we look over here, Z, for example, the tiny little box in the, in the code case, Where's Z? Okay, well, here's Z. So that, we start here. So that's dash, dash, dot, dot, or da, da, did it, is the letter Z. And the, the other one, similarly, B, da, did it, it, one dash, three dots. So that, that's how Morse code was, was developed. Kind of cool, isn't it? So Vericode, uh, what do we mean by Vericode? Again, different letters have different numbers of code elements so that uh, words with E's in them wind up getting transmitted faster because the E just takes a very short amount of time. So that's kind of cool. And it goes way back before we even had radio. That's when they were using wire telegraph. So Morse code is a code trans that translates English text into ones and zeros. So I guess you could say it's the original digital mode. The idea of variable length codes, most frequently used characters get shorter codes. So here's some examples, longer ones and shorter ones. And they were picked on the dependence of the, the frequency that they appear in English words. Then we've got something called the gray code, moving on to another flavor of code. Now, um, this goes back, well, 1878. Now, we, we didn't have radios in 1878, but we did have, have heavy-duty machinery. And heavy-duty machinery uh, operated with, with relays and, uh, and switches. And I don't know if we had missiles back at that time, but the um, consequences of making a, an error in, in reading codes could, could launch a missile accidentally or could drop a heavy item that wasn't supposed to be released yet, for example. Now the idea of the gray code, it's a digital code, code used where only one bit changes between sequential code values. So here we've got decimal, zero through seven in this case, it could go higher. In binary, here are the binary values and here's the gray code values. What makes gray code unique is that for every step, 0, 1 through 7, there's only one bit that's changing between successive numbers. So when we go from 0 to 1, this position gets changed, which is, is the same for, for binary. But when we get from 1 to 2, notice what happens in binary. This bit has to change, and this bit has to change to represent the number 2. In gray code, though, we're only going to be changing one bit. We go from 001 to 011. We've only changed one bit. And as you go down the list, you'll see that only one bit is changing every single time we advance the number. So that's the concept of a gray code. And that was originally to avoid uh, or reduce the number of, of errors or make errors detectable when relays and, and switches would fail, which could have disastrous consequences in, in industrial applications. In our world, ham radio, gray code is often used with rotary, rotary encoders. And gray code can facilitate error detection because we're expecting these things to change one at a time. And if they don't, then something's wrong that, that can be detected.
So here's a little bit bigger picture of the actual code. And rotary encoder, this is a bit easier to see. Now the VFO knob on your radio, um, you may notice that you turn your VFO knob and it has no stop. It'll just keep going around and around and around. Any of the knobs under your radio that have no stop are, are referred to as encoders. Most of them are rotary encoders that work like this. With, within the, the part, there's an LED, a light source, and it's shining through a code wheel. So as you turn your VFO knob, you are impressing different light patterns back behind the code wheel. And these are in, interpreted as numbers and will advance your frequency going up and down. So that, that's the, compens or the um, idea of a, uh, of a rotary encoder used extensively in ham radio. But I think the main point that they wanted to get across here is just it's another kind of digital code. Then another one, I think this is the last one that we'll talk about in relation to codes, ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Uh, this um, is how uh, information is sent um, commonly with, within your computer, ones and zeros. Uh, well, a bit, of course, we saw was a zero or one. <clears throat> and then uh, because we've got seven bits, which is 100 and 128 different states, uh, we can represent all of the letters, upper and lower case, and, and numbers. So if we send a code, this is actually eight, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, zero, one, zero, 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 one, that corresponds to the letter A. There's a table that has all of these um, translations in it that I'll show you. And then you can take these individual letters Okay, so eight bits can be combined into a byte, and then bytes can be sent consecutively. So here we've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. It's a different number of bits in each one of those representing those letters. And then those bytes can be concatenated into packets. So we can have a header, we can have data or payload, and then parity and redundant data and all kinds of things over here. We'll get into more of that next week. But this, this is what uh, ASCII is commonly used for, creating uh, more, more information and uh, allowing us to combine letters and eventually creating packets. 1960, so you can see that now instead of back in the pre-radio days, we, we're coming into the uh, current century. All right, now who do you suppose this um, good looking guy is here? That's uh, Emile Badeau, which is how I'll pronounce it. It's a French telegraph engineer. So we're, we're going back in history again. And notice this magic thing that I put in blue, five bits. So the Badeau code got five bits. And, and here's how they work. We've got letters going across the top. And then we've got figures going across this row. And if we wanted to switch between the two, there's a little box I've highlighted here, letters or figures. So if we're sending text and we want to start sending figures, we'll send this code. And then we'll be transmitting the figures line until we go back to the letters and then we'll be sending letters again. So what we have here, these little holes in the middle, those are sprocket holes uh, that you pull the tape with and these represent data bits so if I punch a hole here that represents a one <clears throat> so this is one one zero 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 Got five code elements or five bits I've highlighted the letter D because we're going to see that again in a minute D is one zero zero one zero Okay, so we, we kind of see how that all fits together. And now let's look at it from a different point of view. Here's our tape again. <clears throat> Bado works uh, with two tones, two audio tones called Mark and Space. And those are interesting terms too because Mark originally meant 
that you have a solenoid on a pen and when you activate that, it pulls the pen down to a moving piece of paper and puts a mark on it. When you release that, then the pen rises and you wind up with a space. So that, that's, the, that's the history between, be, behind mark and space. So what's going on here, we've got a rest condition, which is typically a, a mark tone being sent continuously. And then we've got a start symbol. So when mark goes away and space begins, that tells the uh, computing equipment, okay, start paying attention now, there's a letter coming. We've got B0, remember I said bits one through five before, they start with zero in this case, zero, one, two, three, four, which, which is five. So, all right, so pay attention, something's coming. So what's in this space? Well, the mark tone just went. Remember I said the D was, um, what did I say? One, zero, zero, one, zero. One, zero, zero, one, zero. So one, zero, zero, one, zero. Aha, uh -huh. so data symbol for a D. We have just noticed that that's what was sent. And then how do we tell if we're done? Well, there's a stop symbol, which is about um, two and a half bits, I believe, or one and a half bits of the mark tone. And then that mark tone just hangs out there until the next start symbol comes, and then the process continues. Mark and space tones, by the way, if you're curious, are uh, 2125 and 2295 typically. And if you listen to an RTTY signal on the air, that's the, uh, the, the, the well-known diddle diddle sound. Um, I don't think I recorded that here for this, this uh, class, but uh, that, that's what it would actually sound like on the air. little bit on, on ASCII at this point, and then we'll probably take a break. So ASCII has got, and Bado, um, th these things are common, well, with one exception here. We've got start bits and stop bits. We don't have any parity bits with, with Bado, but we do with ASCII. So transmissions are asynchronous, which means um, we, we've got the mark tone going in the case of Bado continuously, and then if we send a start bit to tell the other side to start paying attention to what's coming next and when to stop. Okay, for ASCII, an advantage of using parity bits is that some types of errors can be detected. Be detected. Now, what, what are parity bits, you're probably wondering? Well, um, if, if there's going to be seven or eight, depending upon the, the flavor of ASCII that we're using, we're going to count the number of ones and the numbers number of zeros, actually just the number of ones, and if there's an even number of ones, then we're going to set the even parity bit. So we, we can tell electronically if the right number of ones are there. We don't know if the, they're in the right position, we don't know if there might be multiple errors, but some types of errors can be detected, wrong number of ones. So for even parity, even number of ones, odd parity is the odd number of ones in a data frame, and that's configurable on both ends. But no parity is the most common because electronic devices can, can typically uh, operate much more reliably than the old mechanical devices. And another little bit of trivia, used to be with mechanical printers, they'd always have two stop bits. And that was because it took a mechanical uh, printer longer to detect the change and to react to it. So typically we'll see things like um, seven bits, no parity, and uh, maybe one stop bit. And that has to be configured on both the transmitting and the receiving end for communication to occur. So we've got 1.5 stop bits for Bado, which means that they're just holding the, the mark space for um, that length of time. Typically one for ASCII, two is for mechanical printers. We always see one for the electronic devices. Here's an ASCII table for seven bits, 128, and here's the table. These are um, representation of, of what it's called. There's one here called the bell. That would actually ring a bell on the, on the teleprinter. So decimal, hex, and then the, the uh, character that it represented, you can see that there's um, punctuation marks, we've got all of the caps, we've got all of the lowercase letters. 
Now, speaking of uppercase and lowercase, remember that type case that I showed you before? Well, it, it had separate sections. The upper part of the case was caps. The lower part of the case was for the lower, the, the small letters. So thus, uppercase and lowercase. So another little factoid that you probably never knew. So ASCII Advantage over Bado can send both upper and lowercase text. Actually, yeah, we've got some questions here. Let's do the questions before we take a break. I, I know that we've kept you for quite a while here, but while it's still fresh in your mind, I'd rather go through these. So first of all, what is the definition of symbol rate in a digital transmission? Charlie. Charlie. Yep, rate at which the waveform changes to convey information. The number of times I raise my hand. How many data how may data rate be increased without increasing bandwidth? Charlie. Charlie. Yep. Charlie. Charlie. Assigning, Charlie. Yep. Assigning multiple bits um, using a more efficient digital code. What is the relationship between symbol rate and BOD? Be careful here. Uh, they're the same. Yep, they're exactly the same. And the distractor answers uh, will will kind of eliminate themselves if you get confused there. How does ALE? How do ALE stations establish contact? Automatic link establishment. Link establishment. Alpha. 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 Constantly scans a list of frequencies, activating the radio when the designated call sign is received. Which of the following HF digital modes uses variable length coding for bandwidth efficiency? Delta. That is Delta. Delta. That is Delta, PSK31. What is the advantage of including parity bits in ASCII characters? Delta. 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 Some types of errors can be detected. Wrong number of bits. That might mean that you've got two of them that are bad, but at least some kinds of errors can be detected. What are some of the differences between Bado Digital Code and ASCII? And this one, if you can, re see. if you can I remember, see, yeah, if you can remember the magic number I gave you, you won't have to read all of this crazy text. That, that's why I wanted you to remember five data bits per character. Some of these other things come pretty close, but five is the key there. What is one advantage of using ASCII code for data communications? There's a trick in this one too, so be careful. Or a trap, I should say. Charlie, but I guess I just got Charlie. 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 Yeah, it is Charlie. Charlie. The, um, uh, the, one that, the, one that, um, the one that you could easily fall for is A, it includes built-in error correction features. It is actually error detection with, with the parity. So that's where people have stumbled on that. Which digital code allows only one bit to change between sequential values? Delta. That's our gray code, friend. Yep. We don't want to accidentally be launching missiles. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and take a break, and then we'll come back, and we've got about half an hour um, or so to wrap this up. Uh, we actually have 45 minutes on the clock, but I think we'll finish a little early, which is awesome. And uh, we'll be back in five minutes. So get up, walk around, get a drink of water, uh, let the dog out, whatever.
Okay, we're back after our, our break. I hope everybody did something interesting and fun during their break. Um, I sat here and answered questions for the Zoom people, but I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed that. Um, all right, we'll move on to section 8.2 now, which we'll uh, be covering next. Modulation common below 30 megahertz is the first chart. Now, modern digital modes have very narrow bandwidths, and we're going to consider some of them here. PSK31 used to be the grand champion with the bandwidth of only 37.5. There are some digital modes that are, uh, are narrower than that right now, but the only pool question relates to uh, this one as being the narrowest of a list that they'll give us. And with PSK31, you could get about 50 words per minute if you were typing keyboard to keyboard between you and another ham. Morse at 13 words per minute requires about 52 hertz of bandwidth. It takes up that much spectrum. And single sideband voice, as we've seen, can be um, 3,000 hertz. And the typical person will talk uh, up, up to 120 words per minute. Um, and I, I mentioned to another class that I didn't know if anybody had ever done a study of uh, men versus women being faster or slower, but if, if uh, somebody can talk faster, they'd probably be a better contester. So that, that's something to keep in mind. And he was a brave man. He did it with his wife in the room. Too. Yes, yeah, didn't even get killed. Didn't even get killed. So, and, and sometimes the, um, <laughs> the, the pool questions just ask something off the wall. I, I couldn't figure out why they included this. It says frequency shift keying is a common data emission below 30 megahertz. Well, there's a bunch of common data <laughs> emissions below 30 hertz. I'm not sure why they picked this one, but th th this is one to keep in mind for a pool question. Okay, here's some interesting things about frequency shift keying, and we're going to see that for radio teletype, or RIDI as it's called. We've got two different tones shifting from one frequency to another. Thus, the characteristic deedle deedle sound when you tune into one uh, on, on the radio. The rapidly changing tones are called mark and space, which we've kind of touched on already. Space represents a zero, mark represents one. And here's a spectrum display. And here you can see the signals and the little peaks here. The, the, those are the mark and space tones. They're very distinctive when you see it. And uh, here, here's a waterfall display in an area of, uh, of, of RIDI signals. Now, you'll, you'll really see the RIDI signals light up. There's, there's the RIDI contests that happen a couple times per year, and the band just fills up with, with RIDI. Um, otherwise, it's, it's hard to find. <laughs> but uh, you, you can look at the watering holes and, and see if you can see it. Um, but uh, here, here's some more information and some pictures of what it looks like. A little bit uh, more detail on radio teletype. Where does the RTTY come from? Well, you can see it there. This uses a frequency shift keying mode, mark and space tones. They're 170 hertz apart, typically 2125 and 2295. So the standard spacing is 170 hertz. And then non-standard is anything other than that. The older TNC's uh, terminal node controllers, back before we were doing this all in computers, uh, the PK232 TNC was extremely popular with hams. It used a 200 hertz spacing. Uh, but that's close enough. So they, these, these things would work. There are other flavors of RTTY and other services that use different frequencies. But for, for hams, this, this is what we're going to see. Now, how do we generate frequency shift keying? There's a little controversy in ham circles about this, um, and I'll, I'll touch on that. We've got what's called direct FSK and audio FSK. Direct FSK, we've got a computer sending a digital signal to a computer, and uh, it's eventually, well, here's the radio, um, and it's going to directly modulate the VFO. So if the VFO is um, set to 
um, 29 megahertz, I'll just keep using that for example, um, it, when we go from a one to a zero, it's going to switch a capacitor in and out of, of the oscillator typically, which will actually shift the carrier frequency by 170 hertz. So that's the idea of direct FSK. We're directly shifting, uh, directly modulating the VFO. It's direct FSK. And then we've got audio FSK. We can achieve the same result by creating audio tones that are 170 hertz apart, transmitting them on upper sideband using a sound card, send those audio tones to the radio, and then transmit it out on the air. So uh, audio FSK is single sideband sending audio tones. Direct FSK is directly moving the VFO, directly modulating the VFO. And the controversy in ham circles, some purists, as Kastler calls them, uh, say that, that this is much better. The truth of the matter, though, is if audio FSK is done correctly, then um, you can't tell the difference on the receive side. Now, all modern radios have the ability to handle direct FSK, but if you've got a, a so-called boat anchor radio, something back from the 80s or 90s, um, audio FSK will work just fine if it's set up correctly. So those are the two ways that it can be done. Now, some troubleshooting notes here. Uh, the software used to encode and decode um, I'll keep using uh, radio teletype as an example. We'll typically have one of these um, crossed um, ellipse types of displays. It's a tuning aid or tuning indicator. And when you've got the signal tuned in correctly, the software will give you an indication like this. So we've got the mark and space tones. They should be of equal magnitude. The height and width should be equal, and they should be at right angles to each other. This is properly tuned, uh, completely proper signal. This one over here, C, is not tuned properly. And there's something a little different about this one. Notice that one of these is smaller. The horizontal one it has less magnitude than what you'd expect to be the vertical one. That can be an, uh, an indication of selective fading. Now, if that is an overview, let's go back through this. Diagram A shows proper tuning and equal levels of mark and space tones. Saw that. Diagram B shows mistuning and one weak tone. So that could be possible filter cutoff or something called selective fading. Now, selective fading is kind of a, a interesting because these tones are only 170 hertz apart. And to get a filter that could differentiate 170 hertz at, let's say, 14 megahertz, that would be a really, really sharp filter. We're, we're talking about maybe 12 parts per million or so. But the ionosphere uh, can have some weird effects like that. You can actually get selective fading that will reduce one tone and not affect the other one, which is just, just an incredible thought. It, it's, it's like there's, it's acting like a brick wall filter when we were talking about filters a couple of weeks ago. So that's diagram B. And then C shows mistuning or transmitted tone spacing not accurate. Something other than 170 hertz. The software normally takes care of that. So the, the important thing to remember, selective fading is indicated when one of the ellipses suddenly disappears or becomes smaller. Now we're going to switch uh, to, uh, topics again and start talking about bandwidth for some of the uh, modes that we use as hams. There is a document called the SM.1138-3. Our license manual says 1138-2, but it was written three years ago and now they've updated it a little bit. So this is all of the technical stuff about what we're going to talk about over the next few slides. It's 10 pages, and it's way more information than you ever want to know. But if, if you want to know where some of this stuff comes from, I, I just wanted to share that. And this, this will take you to the PDF if you care to. If any of you are sane, you won't care to. <laughs> so bandwidth versus symbol rate. Um, let me paint a picture for you. 
um, let's, let's say that you've got a bowl of water and uh, it, it's at rest. The water is perfectly smooth and flat. And then you put your finger in the water. Well, you're going to be creating some waves. If you start tapping the water in the middle it, at a rate, you know, let, let's say a CW rate at 13 words a minute, you'll be uh, causing a lot of funny waves to go on. So as the symbol rate goes up, the disturbance in the um, uh, outgoing signal is going to go up. And that, that was a picture that kind of helped me link, link the concept. So here's a formula out of that ITU document, basically, that says the bandwidth in hertz, that means how much spectrum we're taking up. We'd see it on a spectrum display. Bandwidth in hertz is the symbol rate in baud not the bits per second, the symbol rate in baud, that's how many times we're changing the, some characteristic of the carrier per second, times a shaping factor. Well, th this is just concept right now, but bandwidth equals symbol rate times shape factor. The reason that these are in blue is because there's uh, some formulas that refer to this. I'm going to be sharing some tricks where you won't need to use any formulas to solve the pool questions but these are the things that are behind them. Now, no free lunch applies to bandwidth of digital signals. The faster the baud rate, the more bandwidth it's going to consume. So just a high level view, bandwidth equals B times K, baud times something called a shaping factor. Now, what in the world is that? So there's uh, two pool questions that ask specifically about uh, some digital signals. And this one works a little bit differently. So 170 hertz shift, that's our radio teletype. 300 baud ASCII. So here, here's our, what we're dealing with and what is the bandwidth? Well, if you follow the formula that we showed, it's gonna be 1.2 times 170 plus 300 equals 504. Well. I, I don't really want you to have to memorize a, a formula, so I'll give you a different way to do it. And uh, this is the other pool question. So here's the exam tips. The bandwidth that they're looking for will be the answer closest to four times the shift. So in this case, the shift is 170. If we multiply that times four, we're going to get 680 which is the closest answer to 0 0.5, 680, which is uh, 0 0.68 uh, kilohertz, close to 0.5 kilohertz. That's one way to do it, which is the way I used to recommend it. There's a, a better way to do it that will actually get you closer to the right answer, and that's to add the shift and the baud. That way you won't have to remember what to multiply times four <laughs> and get it wrong. So my recommendation is to use shift plus baud. So in this case, 170 plus 300 um, adds up to 680. No, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, 470. I, I wrote my notes down wrong. And 470 is very close to 500. This one worked. This is the other pool question where they give us some values. 400 or 4,800 hertz plus 9,600. Um, will get us to 15.3, uh, close to 15.36 kilohertz. But I, I messed up my notes here. But what, what I'll recommend is when you see a question like this and it asks for the bandwidth, take the shift plus the baud and match that to the closest question. Same thing with this one. Shift plus the baud and match it to the closest uh, answer that they've given you. And these are the exact right answers. We're gonna come really close using my shortcut here. You'll also get it with this one, but then you have to remember which one you multiply, which I would mess up, I think, under pressure. CW is a little bit different. In, the, in this case, we were talking FSK or AFSK. CW is a little bit different. Now, it says the simplest form of doing um, CW is to turn an AM transmitter on and off. 
Now, why in the world would you be turning an AM transmitter on and off? Any thoughts about that? Well, you just you just want to turn the carrier on and off. You're not you are modulating it though to a certain tone, right? Well, um, you're really, really close. Um, with with single sideband, when you press the microphone key, nothing goes out on the air until you talk, right? With AM, every time you uh, would key the transmitter, you'll be sending out the carrier. And CW works by turning that carrier on and off. So that, that's why we'll, we'll see that, uh, well, if you go back to the FCC designator, A1A, that's amplitude modulation, and 1A indicates um, um, Morse code, it, turning it on and off. So that, that's where the AM comes from. We have, we're turning on and off that carrier. We're not actually, it's not an AM mode, it's CW, but we start out with, uh, with AM for, for the carrier. So the bandwidth is determined by the speed and keying envelope. I'll have some pictures of that coming up. Now there's what's called a standard word used in CW. That word is Paris, P-A-R-I-S, and I'll show you a picture in a minute of what that, what that is. A, a word uh, in CW is five characters. You'll notice that Paris has got five letters. And those five letters are kind of special, and I'll show you why. So the bandwidth, here's the formula, is a word PM, a word PM, words per minute times 0.8. They use that for an average um, shaping factor. And then K is between 3 and 5 reflecting the abruptness of the keying waveform, more abrupt is larger. Well, this doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. I'll, I'll show you a diagram that I think will link, link that to something that's more sensible. And the answer that they're looking for, if we apply this formula, at 13 words per minute, the bandwidth is 13 times 0.8 times 5, which is 52 hertz. Well, there's a shortcut for CW that's a whole lot easier than that. If you just take the words per minute times four, in this case, it works out exactly 52. So when they ask for the bandwidth of a 13 word, P, uh, word per minute CW signal, you can just multiply that times four to get to 52 hertz. That's the easy way, rather than having to understand and apply this formula. So now we're going back to Paris. We all have your berets. Mm -hmm. So a word in Morse code is five letters. The standard word is Paris. And the thing that's magical about this, it's not really magical, but it, it, it's the reason that the, this word is used as a reference. Um, the code elements in Morse code are dits uh, and dots and dashes, or dits and das. So Paris is da 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 dit. So we got one dit, we have uh, one dit of silence. Then we've got a da, one dit of silence, a da, a dit of silence, and then signal again. Between each letter, there's the equivalent of three dots, a time, spacing, and then a is da da, with a one dot space in the middle of it, three spaces between the letters, and so forth, on through the s. And then the interword spacing between words in Morse code is seven dits. So we got three dits between the letters and then seven dits between the words. So 50 dit lengths for the word Paris plus the following space is what this uh, reference standard is, I'll call it. The dit is the symbol, so it's 50 symbols per word. One word minute is 50 symbols in 60 seconds, which is works out to about 0.83 baud. Not that any of that matters a great deal to us, but we, we can use multiple um, sequences of the word Paris to calculate uh, data rates and, and things of that nature. It's just helpful to know that, that this is the reference word uh, that, that's used for, for doing timing um, analyses with CW and why it's called the standard word. Now here's a little bit more on bandwidth. Uh, we talked about PSK, phase shift keying. PSK31, also known as BPSK31, same thing, binary phase shift keying. 
very popular keyboard to keyboard mode on HF. Not so much anymore. When uh, FT8 and some of those modes came out, uh, they just took the world by, the, by storm and PSK kind of faded into the background. But it's still there. It's still there. People are using it. It uses the full 128 character ASCII code set and uses variable length characters. That was the very code that we talked about before. And then a couple things from the pool. PSK bandwidth is minimized by shifting phase precisely at the zero crossing of the RF signal. And I'll show you a picture of that. Secondly, PSK bandwidth is also reduced by using sinusoidal data pulses. Again, I have a di diagram of that. The actual bandwidth turns out to be 37.5, but they don't ask us that. And uh, at the time that this was written, it was one of the narrowest HF digital modes. And there's all kinds of variations. This is true of a lot of the digital modes. So there's PSK16, PSK125, uh, quadrature phase shift keying 63, so, and many, many more. So we, we've been, the original was PSK31, but uh, different variations have come about since then. So I'll come back to this slide in a minute, because after I show you the diagram, I think these two things will make more sense. So there, there's two concepts here. We've got ones and zeros, and they're basically divided over time. So for each unit of time, we're measuring to see what is the phase in, in that unit of time. So here we've got a signal, and notice at this point right here, the phase shifts by 180 degrees. You'd normally expect to see it go up and continue, but it immediately reverses and goes the other way. So that's a 180 degree phase shift, and then it's going to, going to continue with no change over two, I'll call them time slots here, not to be confused with multiplexing like we were talking earlier. Um, so over, over two time slots in the digital waveform, we're going to continue. So we've got one, and then we've got a 180 degree phase shift, and then we're going to continue over two time slots for two zeros. Ah, and here's another phase shift, 180 degree phase shift, and we're going to hold that for the space of, of two characters. So we get a one and a one, and on and on it goes. So that's the concept of, of uh, well, two things. First of all, I showed you how we were getting the 180 degree phase shifts, and they were ha happening at exactly the zero crossing points of the waveform. Now, the thing that's good about that is that at the zero crossing point, there's no RF being sent out. So we're, we're not going to be disturbing the outgoing uh, transmit waveform nearly as much by doing the phase shift at the zero crossing points. Now the sinusoidal data pulses concept, uh, we, we can't see the phase here very well, and this doesn't line up exactly, but uh, in, in this case we've got uh, a phase shift happening here, but we're not going to immediately cause that signal to, to, to jump back up to its full amplitude. We're going to gradually raise it, and then we're, when we're going to do another phase shift, we'll gradually diminish it, do the phase shift, and then come back up again that makes for a lot less disruption in, in the transmitted output. Now let me go back and let's see if, if these words make any more sense. PSK bandwidth is minimized by shifting phase precisely at the zero crossing of the RF signal. Well, we, we saw that here, zero crossings. And PSK bandwidth is also reduced by using sinusoidal data pulses, which we see here. So hope, hopefully that'll, that'll help, make the, help the words make more sense. And then we'll talk about CW. Uh, there's something here, uh, there's a, a trap here. You've got to think carefully. If we were going to be turning on our, this is talking CW and key clicks. Key clicks are bad. Uh, if we're going to turn on the carrier instantly, and then when we raise our telegraph key immediately, stop the carrier, that's the e equivalent of, of a square wave. And as you remember, square waves send lots of harmonics. So we do shaping with CW. So when we key the transmitter, rather than the RF immediately going to full power, it kind of gradually goes up, goes to full power, and then gradually comes down when we let go of the key. That's called proper shaping. So to reduce key clicks, increase keying waveform rise and fall times. 
And here, here's where the, the, the trick is. Now, which one of these two, A or B, has the faster rise time? A, A, A yes, yep, the faster. it's really fast. Okay, so to reduce key clicks, increase the keying waveform rise and fall times. So we're increasing the rise time here, which is shaping the pulse, and increasing the fall time, which gives us a shaped pulse here, a shaped signal. So it's real easy to get these backwards. Is the circuitry doing this automatically? It is. In the radio? Okay. Yep. Yep. And if you've looked at any of the QST product reviews, which I'm sure you have, I don't know if you understood this when you saw it, but this is what your telegraph key is doing, or your keyer. This is what's actually going out on the air because the circuitry in the radio is, is shaping that transmitted signal to, to give you the, uh, uh, the, the difference in rise times. All right, and this is our final set of questions. What is the approximate bandwidth of a 13 word per minute international Morse code transmission? Right, it's four times 13, correct. Let me spotlight. What factors affect the bandwidth of a transmitted CW signal? Remember there were two. Charlie. 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 Keying speed Charlie. and shape factor, rise and fall times. What is the primary effect of extremely short rise or fall times on a CW signal? And be careful with this one. Charlie. Bravo. Charlie. Bravo. You can create harmonics, but I think it's Charlie. Yeah, it is Charlie, and I don't know if I spent much time talking about this, but the effect of having those very sharp uh, rise and fall times is, is uh, it actually sounds like clicks. If you're lis listening to it on, on the air, you should hear a nice smooth... So it's the harmonics you're hearing when you say key clicks. Yes, yes, and you can actually tune away from, because you, you do have all of that harmonic all the harmonics and noise, you can actually tune away from the signal and still hear it clicking. So that, that, that's, a, that's a bad thing. And it happens because of the RF harmonics. I think that's why some people pick B. What is the most common method of reducing key clicks? And this is the one I warned you you'd want to get backwards. The one I warned you you'd want to get backwards. Alpha? A. Yes, increased keying waveform rise and fall times. In other words, you're slowing it down by increasing the rise and fall times um, that causes the, the shaped waveform. <coughs> Which of the following types of modulation is common for data emissions below 30 megahertz? Bravo. That is Bravo. Oh, and uh, you, you can kind of el Bravo. eliminate that by uh, uh, looking at the distractors. What is indicated when one of the ellipses in an FSK crossed ellipse display suddenly disappears? Alpha. 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 Selective fading has occurred. Correct. What is the difference between direct FSK and audio FSK? The great controversy. FSK is Alpha. better. <laughs> right. <laughs> Alpha. Well, alpha. Yeah. alpha is the answer that, that we actually want, yes. Direct FSK applies the data signal to the transmitter VFO. That's why it's called direct. Well, AF, AFSK transmits tones via phone uh, sideband, typically. What is the bandwidth? Ah, okay, see if you can remember this one now. What is the bandwidth of a 170 hertz shift, 300 baud ASCII transmission? Charlie. Charlie. It is Charlie. Charlie. Yep, you can add the 170 and 300. That's what I'd recommend, and that's very close. What is the bandwidth? This is the other one of a 4800 hertz frequency shift, 9600 baud ASCII FM transmission. Alpha. 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 Right. Alpha. Happens to be the, the largest, <clears throat> largest answer as well. Which of these digital modes, now when it says which of these digital, it means of the ones that are listed here. That's our PSK31. Yep. That's our yep. PSK31. We haven't, we haven't talked about a lot of the rest of these. 
Why should phase shift keying of a PSK signal be done at zero crossing of the RF signal? Yeah. Alpha. 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 Alpha is correct to minimize the bandwidth. And what technique minimizes the bandwidth of a PSK31 signal? Charlie. Yep, that's Charlie, the use of sinusoidal data Charlie. pulses. It's like the gradual, gradual rise and fall times of CW, same concept. And that will wrap it up for tonight. I said we'd probably get out about 15 minutes early. It's actually going to be about nine minutes early. So next week, it's going to be Chapter 8, Part 2. So more, more fun to follow. <laughs> We're going to have the, um, so go ahead and read the, the balance of the chapter. And the Kessler videos, uh, 8.2 and 8.3, We've you've already seen most of 8.2 if you're following him. And uh, I'll, I'll also send a, a, a prep email like, like we always do. So that'll, that'll finish off chapter uh, uh, eight. Now the, the last part is about amateur television, 8.3. 8 um, some of this um, isn't in much use anymore, but there's a mess of pool of questions. I'm guessing when they revise this, there'll probably be a, a, a lot less since it's not really used very much anymore. But uh, that's what we'll need to cover next week. And Gary, being a broadcast engineer, uh, will probably have some good things to add as, as we go through that section. Well, I'll give you my two cents anyway, yeah. Yep. Never yep. twice the same color. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. remember that. Never twice the same color. Yeah, that, yep, that'll come up next week. And uh, for those who are watching... I have another question. Okay, go ahead. Another really crazy question. Those are when the best. you reshape the waves, or you cut off the corners, right? Yeah. Do the waves have any content? And, and when you cut it off, do you change anything? Well, you just don't allow it to go out. You, you prevent it from going out. So you, you delay, um, when you first press your telegraph key, it won't immediately start transmitting. It, it's, gonna, it's like an RC time constant. Remember when we talked about those? Um, those will be applied, and it, it won't let it build up to full until after a certain delay has occurred. Yeah, it'll have no okay, effect on the content. No effect on the content. Yeah, good way to say it. Thank you. Okay, anything else? One question. Sure. Do you think the FCC will ever mandate uh, all spectrum and radio to go to uh, digital, like television has? Well, I don't think so, and the reason that I, I don't know, okay, but I don't think so because... Uh, amateur radio is an experimental hobby, so all all modes um, and, and protocols are, are supported as, as long as they're public. I think we'll have what we have now for, for a very long time, if, if people choose to use it. Some uh, new modes will crowd out others, like FT8 is really crowded out, PSK31. Uh, things will change over time, but I, I think that the originals will still be there for purists that want to use them. That's why we'll keep teaching the classes because they'll keep changing the questions and mm -hmm. the, the new technologies. And mm -hmm. we, we've got to learn it before we can teach it. Yep. At Ho least that's the thought. Hopefully. Have any modes actually gone away? Um, well, they've fallen into disuse. For example, there's dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of digital modes that have come on the scene and have faded away and are virtually non-existent anymore. So, yeah, that, it, it happens over time. All right. Any well, I was going to ask Gary if he wanted to tell us anything about well, next week. I'm just going to mention that uh, tomorrow morning I'll uh, have in the description box on the YouTube web page uh, for this video I'll have a link uh, to Dropbox, uh, which is where all of the handouts uh, for this class will be. I have noticed one thing with Dropbox: either something has changed with their links, or something has changed in the operating systems. It used to be you could reliably click on the link and it would take you there. Um, nowadays, I recommend you actually copy the entire link and then paste it into your browser and then hit enter, and that will take you reliably to where the folder mm -hmm. is where the handouts are. Otherwise, we've seen you get error messages or you get asked to sign up for Dropbox, which is not what we intend at all and mm -hmm. not how it used to operate. So, um, and I always uh, try to put a little disclaimer, a little note. Uh, below the link uh, now in the uh, description box. Uh, and if you'd like to get emails, uh, just send me an, e an email to get on our list. Uh, send it to W4EEY, that's my call sign, W4EEY 
at ARRL dot net. ARRL dot net. And just say, hey, I'd like to get on the extra class mailing list. And uh, for the remainder of the class, you'll get all of the announcements and links. Right. Some, sometimes we get inputs from students that uh, uh, tune into the channel after the class uh, sequence is over and they've asked to be put on the mailing list. The mailing list is only active while we're running yeah, the we'll class. Yeah, concluding this class in May of 2023. So right. if it's after then, um, well, no, no good. <laughs> yeah, the mailing list won't exist after that. Okay, good. All right, well, next week, um, continue reading and I'll be sending out a, a prep email. Rebecca's waving, so I'll wave back. You're doing good. Yep, hang in there. 73, y'all. Yep. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys. 73s. Thank you. You bet.